Thank you very much. And before I kick off, I would like to say thank you to the organisers for allowing me to speak first on the first day of this brand new conference. It's an absolute honour and I'm sure this will be the first of many. Okay, so thanks for coming. Um, this is my talk on games development with TypeScript and Canvas, so let's get started. Hello, I'm James. I'm a software developer who works with various technologies and languages, but primarily I would say JavaScript and C-sharp. Uh, I've gained experience at a lot of mainly British companies, but some more international too, like Sky TV, Channel 4 Television, Trainline, News UK, Netaporte, so a variety of industries as well. And I absolutely love open source software, writing, speaking, otherwise I wouldn't be here today, and mentoring, especially junior developers. And I work at YLD. We are a software engineering and design consultancy. Now, technologically, we work mainly with JavaScript, so that's like TypeScript, Node, React, React Native as well. But we're doing a lot of DevOps work in terms of the culture, but also the cloud stack like Kubernetes, Docker, etc. Okay, so now the spiel's out of the way, let's get into the uh, good stuff. So, what are we actually going to build today? I'm not sure if you're familiar with this game, I'm guessing most of you are, but just in case, this is Pac-Man. It's one of the most like, popular arcade games of the 1980s, uh, developed by Namco. And um, yeah, it was like one of the pioneering arcade games of that time, so we are going to build this. But with what tech stack? How are we going to build it? So we can use TypeScript as our language, so it's a statically typed superset of JavaScript. Uh, we're going to use the Canvas API for visual output, and we're going to use a sprinkle of web audio as well to get some sound in there to make it really engaging. So let's start at a good point, in my opinion. What is TypeScript? So actually, it'd be interesting. Uh, put your hands up if you've used TypeScript. Okay, well, so that's a good majority of the audience, so I'll keep this brief, but just in case, I've got a little primer anyway. So it's a statically typed superset of JavaScript, or more specifically ECMAScript, that is to say, it supports the constructs of JavaScript and ECMAScript, but then also it introduces static typing and syntactical constructs for that capability. So here's a brief example. Now, I don't actually have any type annotations on this. This looks like vanilla JavaScript or ECMAScript. So all I'm doing here is I'm using string.prototype.charcode app to get the UTS-16 code point for uh, that particular um, string, and I'm specifying, a string in, uh, I'm specifying a value of zero to get the code point for the letter A. But the problem is, I haven't specified a number value, I've specified a string. Now, funnily enough, in JavaScript, that still works, but nonetheless, there are potential side effects, and with other APIs, if you're passing the wrong types, you'll get all sorts of bizarre runtime errors. So when we, we run TSC, which is the TypeScript compiler against this example, you will see a compile time error that uh, an argument of type zero, which is a string literal, not being assignable to a parameter of type number. So imagine in a larger scale code base, this is gonna save us a lot of headaches and we can get this sort of diagnostic information much earlier before we start debugging at runtime in the browser or in Node. So here's a bit more of an involved example. So we have some type annotations here. So Oh, there's a bit of a divide as to whether you annotate everything or you let inference um, do a lot of the work and leverage that. I prefer the latter approach, but there are some cases in which you can't infer like return types or value types, for, ex uh, for example. So here what we're doing is we've got a simple, val uh, simple example that will fetch a video with the fetch API from a URL, and then it will convert it to a blob of data. And because we can't necessarily infer that, we have this return annotation that says it will return a promise that will resolve with a blob. And then what we can say is, um, 
in, in the main body of our code, we get a HTML video element, and we pass it this uh, type in uh, angle brackets, and that's called a type parameter or a generic parameter. And what this says is, because query selector just returns type element by default, we can be more specific with the type of element that it will return, and then we can infer as a result that this player value or DOM reference will have a source property associated with it. So again, this gives us a lot of valuable information at compile time. But yeah, why? Well, we can build and refactor large scale code bases with compile time feedback, as I've just mentioned. And types can, to an extent, serve as documentation, so you know in particular what an API will return or what values it will accept. Uh, dynamic typing is awesome, don't get me wrong, and I still leverage JavaScript itself quite heavily. But in a project that requires like the reuse of small units, scattered across a large code base, pre-runtime feedback reduces debugging effort, so it's very valuable in my opinion. Now we've chosen our language, how are we actually going to render our game? With the Canvas API, which is an API that provides us rendering context for 2D raster graphics and WebGL for 3D stuff, but we're going to be looking at the 2D stuff today. So here we have a simple example. So because Canvas is a HTML element, um, typed in TypeScript and known in JavaScript as HTML canvas element, what we can do is we can create one of these elements in our DOM just using HTML, and then in JavaScript we can grab this DOM element, and then it has a specific method upon it called getContext. You can either pass WebGL, or in our case, you can pass 2D. And what this gives you is it gives you a reference for writing to this context directly. So in this example, we set the context's fill style property to red, and then we invoke the context.fillRect method, and we give it x, y coordinates, and then a width and a height. And the output, quite simply, is a red square on the page. So contrast this with HTML and the DOM. So whereas you have um, a, a DOM and a tree structure and all this semantic information, which is great for traditional uh, web pages and even web apps, with Canvas, you're writing almost, not on a per pixel level, but you're outputting raster graphics directly to this context. So in games and other applications that are non-traditional, it's oftentimes a much better option than the DOM. And TypeScript also provides built-in definitions for the DOM in general, but also we get types, uh, sorry, we get canvas definitions as well. So all of the static analysis benefits we get with TypeScript extend to our usage of the canvas API. So I also hear that this thing called sound is pretty popular in video games as well. So we can achieve this with the web audio API. Um, it's kind of analogous to Canvas, but instead of rendering graphics, we're rendering audio. And it's built upon this audio node paradigm where we can have inputs such as an MP3 or an oscillator. We could manipulate them with effect nodes, say you could have like a reverb or convolver, sorry and then outputs such as the user speakers. And because they're nodes, you can interconnect them and build complex audio graphs. So here's a really brief example. So we create an audio context instance. So this is just a global constructor available in the browser. Uh, we create an oscillator. And what an oscillator does is it emits a particular waveform, um, such as a sine wave, a square wave. So it's just a constant real-time generated sound. Then we create a gain node that allows us to control how loud or how quiet the sound is. And then what we do is we set the oscillator to be a square wave. We set its frequency to 200 hertz. Uh, we connect the oscillator to the gain node. And then we connect the gain node to context.destination, which is usually the user speakers. So this is what drives the audio node and audio graph paradigm, the ability to connect the nodes. And then we start the oscillator, and then you stop it three seconds later. So it's amazing how we can just produce sound in real time in the browser. 
And again, like Canvas, TypeScript gives us built-in type definitions, which is super cool. Uh, now for some Game Dev 101. So we've got the effective technology stack. So yeah, let's look into some uh, Game Dev 101 and some of the core principles we'll be using. So the game loop, which is a recursive-ish function that updates entities over time. And the reason I say ish is because it's, an, it's, a, it's effectively a function that calls itself, but we'll use uh, another API to call the game loop over and over. And in the browser, that function is the globally available request animation frame. And the reason we use this is because we can schedule for our game loop update to occur before the browser next repaints. So here's an example of our game loop. So I wouldn't worry about all of these system type things for now. All of these uh, objects will be going into what they are later. But we have a function named loop, and it receives time, which is actually a, I think it's a DOM high resolution timestamp the name of that type, but TypeScript recognizes it as a number for some reason, but it doesn't really impact us. And then what we do in our game loop is we clear any graphics we've previously written to the canvas. Uh, we perform all of our game loop logic, so these are all of these system.update calls. And then once we've done the particular game logic for that frame, we then enqueue the next frame by calling request animation frame with loop, so this will repeat and this will loop infinitely effectively. But there is a caveat here. For 60 FPS performance, you cannot surpass a total frame time of 16.666 reoccurring milliseconds. Otherwise, you get jank. Uh, a sprite. So a sprite is a 2D bitmap image data that can be computed from a larger sprite sheet image. So in our game, here's our sprite sheet. Now, there's a lot of excess stuff. You've got the version with the food rendered on it, but you have the map, for example. You have all the sprites for Pac-Man, the ghosts, uh, the text as well. Uh, so in JavaScript, I've chosen to represent it as this. So you have an abstraction where sprites is an actual HTML image element of the sprite sheet, and then you pass uh, these definitions, which uh, comprised of the name of the sprite, so say Pac-Man, the reason there's a number we'll go into as well, Blinky, which is the red ghost, and then the map tiles as well. And then these coordinates in this inner array are the X and Y coordinates on that image, and then the width and height in pixels. So if we look at Pac-Man, for example, um, that's that particular section of that sprite sheet. And in order to do this, we use the Create Image Bitmap API. And what this allows us to do is take the image. So you have a type called Canvas Image Source, which can be a HTML image element, or it can be bitmap data directly. And then it takes those definitions. And for each one, what Create Bitmap Image lets you do, which is really cool, is it just lets you take an image give it the dimensions, and then it will create a new bitmap image for you. So all I'm doing is abstracting this away for the user, and then it returns a new map with the names you've passed, but with the actual the values resolving to the actual bitmap data. And then in order to get a sprite, all you have to do is call spritesheet.get, and then you have the bitmap data, and you can use uh, the canvas rendering context 2D's draw image method, to draw that sprite wherever you want in the pixel space. Now, input is, of course, I'm sure you all know, but I'll just reiterate, it's a means of capturing user interaction from a hardware device in order to interact with the game, right? It's kind of what you need, otherwise you wouldn't be playing it. It would just be super interactive. Well, it wouldn't be interactive, sorry. So keyboard events are a great fit for traditional web apps, as are events in general, I guess. So when you have a UI, it's often event-driven. You're responding to different interactions or other events from elsewhere. But for a loop-driven architecture, it, it doesn't really fit. Like Subscribing to event handlers can get really messy, so it would be a lot better to poll an abstraction for recent keyboard events. So what we have here is an abstraction for the keyboard, where we do register for the key down event, 
but what we do is we hold a we hold the value using a closure to the last pressed key and then in the code so this is the logic that handles the direction that a uh, pacman should go in for the key press so for each update you just get the last pressed key so you don't have to worry about subscribing to events you just grab the last pressed key and internally that keyboard abstraction will keep track of this as the user changes the arrow they press okay a tile based engine so this is a means of laying levels out in columns and rows of repeatable cells so this is intrinsic to pacman and how it's designed so here's the level layout again and we have these uh, these are called union types and what they allow us to do is so you can specify any particular type and you can combine them so you sh so it's effectively that an outer corner should be one of those values and you can actually string literals as these types so an outer corner, we just arbitrarily assign A0, A1, A2, etc. And I should add the number is the rotation in radians, and I'll go over why on the next slide we do that. And then we can effectively combine these into another union type, sorry, another intersection type. No, that is a union type, sorry. So we can combine them into a, another union type, and we can say a tile is any one of those values. So when we're building our data, if you pass a string foo, TypeScript will be like, well, no, that's not a valid tile, so I'm going to fail to build. So yeah, these are the um, these are some of the tiles in correspondence to the actual sprites. So you have the outer corner, which is this top corner. You have the straight wall, which is like the outer wall. You have the single inner wall, the corners. And then you also have this concept of a walkable tile as well. So that doesn't render anything, but this is because we can tell, uh, so effectively in our Ghost and Pac-Man movement logic, we can say, well, this tile is walkable, so they can move here, but then you have walls, so you can't go through a wall, obviously, which is kind of ironic given the enemies are called ghosts, but I don't know what the designers were thinking. And that's what the actual map data looks like. So it's a great hunk of JavaScript. So it's a 2D array of um, these tile values, so you have things like C0, which is like the outer wall going across. And I did this by hand, by the way, and it's exhausting. A tip a good friend gave me recently is you can, and this sounds crazy, he had to do the same thing. He used Excel, and you can color coordinate the, um, the cells effectively, and then you can output it as a CSV, which if I did that, it would have saved me a lot of time, but I couldn't think of how to automate it initially. But yeah, that's the entire map data for the game. So yeah, it, it wasn't fun at all. So in order to determine if a tile is walkable, as I mentioned, that's what this uh, O uh, string literal type refers to. And you might notice this syntax, tile is walkable. And in TypeScript, this is called a type guard. So what this allows you to do is not only ascertain if a value is true or false, but if it's true, it means the parameter you've passed into it or the parameter you've referenced in the guard is of that type. So again, we're getting more static information for uh, our compile time feedback, which is incredibly useful. So our map enables two principles. So the level rendering, but also the movement, as I said, by having explicit walkable tiles, both the, well, the, the shared logic actually for the ghosts and the Pac-Man know that we can only follow these particular paths. Now let's get on to vectors. So this is a concept from linear algebra and geometry, but to, to reduce it down, it's effectively a set of coordinates within a multi-dimensional space. So in the case of Pac-Man, we're working in a 2D space. So 3D stuff is when you, well, you can involve matrices in, in 2D games dev as well, I guess, but it's not something we're looking at today, fortunately. So typically, this is a collection of two values in a 2D space that represent x and y coordinates. So it, yeah, it can represent position, but you can represent like x and y speeds, directions, and other transformations as well. 
So in TypeScript, and I guess in JavaScript by extension, arrays can be used to represent these vectors. So I have a type called point2d, and what this is, is it's a tuple array. So a tuple array is just like any other regular array, but you can determine its length with the syntax. So I could keep going number, 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 or I could mix the types. This is eff effectively how the uh, sprite sheet abstraction works. So say, hypothetically, we have a position of Pac-Man. So this is the third column on the third row. Uh, we have a direction, so that's the trajectory in which it's traveling. So it's moving one column across, so to the right, and it's not moving down at all on the y-axis. Alternatively, that one could be negative, and then the particular entity would be moving left. And then we have a speed as well. So the speed is by how many columns and rows it should move at a time. So this can be any number, but the point is of multiplying it by the direction, you can tell, you can effectively cancel out the speed for a, a, a given tick of the game loop. So these can be neatly operated upon with built-in array methods. So, okay, we had the same examples, the position, the direction, and the speed. So let's say we want to move this entity to its new position for its next tick. So we can add the vectors together. So what we do is we add the position to the multiplication of the speed and the direction. So uh, for a speed of 2, 2 multiplied by 1, 0, so you multiply uh, the respective items together, you'd end up with 2, 0. And then, you'd m and then you'd add 2, 0 to 3, 3, which is 5, 3. So what that's saying is its new position goes from 3, 3 to 5, 3, and the y position doesn't change because the direction for the corresponding y value is 0. And then what we can do is we can use um, typical JavaScript code. I've gone a bit more functional here. We can use things like map and reduce, so for the vectors we want to add together, you take the current vector and then well you take sorry, you take the particular item in each uh, in each vector and then you add it to the next one. And same with the multiplication as well. So you can abstract a lot of that logic away. And again we're using generic parameters. Um, but you'll notice when we call add vectors and multiply vectors, we don't actually specify what that type parameter is. And that's because TypeScript, in this instance, can actually infer it. So if you inspect the type information for this call to add vectors, you'll see it resolves to point 2D automatically because we know at, what, what you know, we know at this point what types we're working with. So congratulations, you are all now game developers. So you passed the test, so big pat on the back. So let's write our first AAA title. N no, I'm just kidding, I'm not that crazy. Um, nonetheless, how can we combine these pieces in a scalable way to build a game? Well, firstly, let's consider inheritance. So in TypeScript, well, in JavaScript, you have classes. You have the same in TypeScript as well, but they're static statically analyzed, so they're more analogous to, say, Java or C-sharp classes. So naturally, one might suggest having a class for Pac-Man and a class for the ghost, but then you realize a lot of the logic is duplicated. It's like, well, Pac-Man renders an image, the ghost renders an image, um, the ghost moves, Pac-Man moves, so shouldn't we be reusing this code? Isn't that what Uncle Bob told us to do? So then you might have an entity-based class. So it's like, oh, great, we're showing our code now, brilliant. But then you introduce a tile for the map, which is fine because a tile can be rendered, but it can't be moved, and it also can't be animated. So all of a sudden, this means of code reuse via inheritance, it's just broken and it doesn't work. So inheritance can be uh, effective, that should read, in describing the overall hierarchy of a system. I think it gets a bit of a bad rep sometimes. But it's not an appropriate means of code reuse and sharing code. If you want to describe system taxonomy, then yeah, that's awesome, go for it. But for code reuse, we should probably leverage composition instead. And there are various ways of doing this, depending upon the architecture of your application. 
but for game loops, a suitable architectural pattern for us is entity component system. So let's, let's break these terms down. So an entity, it's a game object composed by different components. So here, we have uh, the code for binding the ghosts. So what we have is we effectively take, in, take in a set of systems for different concerns as dependencies. So the system for rendering sprites, the system for tracking a particular component, in this case, Pac-Man's positional wall component. So what effectively we have is, in my uh, implementation, an entity is just a call site. And what this call site does is it just creates a bunch of components. So you have a component for positioning something. You have a component for moving something, for specifying that it has a speed. Um, you have a component for rendering as a sprite, etc. And then you have the component that says it should track this other component. And then effectively, because, because Pac-Man is also renderable and the tiles on the map are also renderable, you get to reuse this code and you're not locked into rigid inheritance graphs. So really, you can think of it as just a call site. So you're probably thinking as well, OK, so what are components then? You specified they each represent a concern, but how do they look? Well, quite simply, they're just, they're almost like data transfer objects. They're just mutable containers of data. I didn't op opt for any encapsulation because of the performance concerns I had with uh, the call stacks for getters and setters, although I have broken that rule in other bit in like other places, but effectively um, it's just a container of data. So for an entity that wants to render a sprite, it can create a sprite renderable component in its function body, and you give it a sprite name, the tile positionable, so where it should be positioned and uh, a particular rotation as well. So that just returns an object with those properties. So that's all it is. It's just a container of data. And then a system. Now, this is where all the fun happens. So a system acts upon a particular component, and it can also receive the current timestamp from request animation frame. So here's the auto movement system. Now, what this does is it doesn't detect what the key presses are, it, because that's something that's used by Pac-Man, but not by the ghosts. All this does is it takes the, um, the uh, movable's um, current um, direction, like which direction it's going in, and then it has an associated positionable, and it's just for each tick of the game loop, it will update the position of a particular entity. So you have one concern, and now this logic can be reused between the ghosts and Pac-Man, even though their means of detecting where to go are entirely different. In terms of creating the system, so the bottom line, we call this create system th function, and we pass it the, the user-defined function. And all this allows you to do is register particular components with a system. So I think if we go back here, uh, to the uh, entity example, should have lined that up a bit better. So you can see how sprite render system dot register. We invoke that with the sprite renderable. We invoke tracking system dot register with tracking movable, etc. And this is handled by the uh, this is handled by the create system abstraction for us. So that returns the object. So you register the components as you create the entity. And then um, in the game loop, you call the update method where you pass it the time. And for each component it has registered, you call the user-defined uh, system function on each component. So going back to our game loop, this is why we had all these references to updating systems. So you kick off the game loop, you receive the time, you clear the uh, output we have, and then for each system, for, so for the, for the sprite rendering, the sprite animation, the player movement, et cetera, you update all of these functions. So let's write some more systems for our game then. So this is the sprite animation system. And what this allows us to do is, it, so this one's a function of time. So this is the time we get from request animation frame. And um, for each tick of the game loop, 
if the time has surpassed the given frame rate, then we mutate the sprite renderable associated with it, and we advance the frame. And then we update, well, that's a property of sprite animatable, sorry, but then we update the associated sprite renderable to advance its frame. So that gives us animation without having to depend on timers. Uh, then we have the keyboard movement system. Now, this is a fun one. So this takes our keyboard abstraction, and it will mutate the direction of the uh, movable. So if it can move to a particular tile, if it's walkable, then um, you set the direction to where you need to go to get to that tile. Otherwise, you, you don't change it. And this is how it looks. So you poll the keyboard. I think I showed this earlier. But you poll the keyboard for that particular tick of the game loop. And if they press left, then you set the directional vector to left. Right, uh, you set the x value of that vector to 1. And then you do uh, analogous operations for up and down. And then this is probably one of the most interesting systems. So this is for the uh, tracking. So it is only used by the ghosts. So what this allows you to do is it gets the neighboring tiles that a entity, or sorry, that component can move in. Um, and then it will get the direction to the closest tile. And what we do in this case is for the neighboring tiles, because it's an array, we, it's an array of vectors, we filter those tiles by the ones we can move to either, so essentially they're walkable and they'll accommodate the size of the entity. And then we get the nearest one. So what we're doing here is we're using some uh, Euclidean geometry to get the distance between the um, tracker position balls, uh, position vector and the target's vector. And we just take the closest one. And then when we put these units together, this is what we get. So I'm not, I've already shown you a lot of the code, so I'm just going to run it from here. So, yep, so we are running on port 8080. Okay, I go to localhost. Okay, here we go. So, yeah, there is some like, I didn't get as far as I wanted, and there is some issue with like the movement, but effectively, we have rendering output, we have audio, I'm interacting with the keyboard, and I have the ghosts following me as well. So yeah, by putting these pieces together, we can effectively build a game. So yeah, that was the video because there were some technical issues, unfortunately, but thanks to the amazing AV team, we overcame them. So of course, there's still a lot to do. There's still loads of features missing from the actual game that was released in the 80s. But now we're in a position where we can add these features in a really scalable way. But for some closing thoughts now, uh, systems are deterministic, which makes the behavior of our games more predictable. So although we are mutating components within them, they are just functions that receive time and do a set of predictable operations. And this means that they also lend themselves to unit testing. So here's a unit test for the sprite animatable. So again, because we're not dependent upon particular timers or anything like that, we're just passing the timestamp in from request animation frame, it's super easy to unit test. So in this case, we're asserting that the next frame is advanced to when the frame rate is surpassed. So you set up your components that are dependencies of sprite animatable, you create your system, and then we expect the initial frame to be zero. We um, animate, we invoke the system with that particular component and that timestamp. And then we inherently expect it to have advanced with the frame and update the sprite name as well. So components encourage the composition of entities as well. So again, inheritance is just too inflexible for this kind of project. Um, but it certainly isn't a silver bullet, this entity component system architectural pattern. So operating on a sequence of entities in a linear fashion within 16.666 recurring, uh, that should say milliseconds, excuse me, it's tricky in larger games.
Uh, and direct mutation of components is somewhat opaque. So I could have done something more based upon return types of objects, which would have been even easier to unit test and um, even easier to effectively determine what its behavior would be based upon its output. But then there are performance concerns, especially when you're allocating loads of um, objects into the young generational space of the garbage collector that your browser uses. They're all typically generational. so that would probably cause too much junk, so I had to go for this approach. But on the other hand, I admit it is kind of difficult to figure out where things are updated at times. And some systems are actually really specific. So you get great reuse from the uh, sprite rendering system because everything is a sprite, uh, the uh, auto movement system for just moving in whatever the, the related direction is. That's all well and good. But if you look at something like the tracking system, well, that's only used by ghosts, so you've got this reusable system, but you're only going to use it in this one context. So admittedly, it can feel a bit overkill in that respect. Oh, and parallelization is super hard as well. So from my experience, I'd never recommend parallelizing unless you have to. It gets very messy because you're having to operate in a linear fashion, and some operations are dependent upon others. But nonetheless, there are approaches, but it's super messy. So to summarize, the web has come a hell of a long way. I mean, think about when it just started off as markup and then a sprinkle of HTML and CSS. Now we have cool APIs like Web Audio and uh, the Canvas API where you can target 2D and 3D rendering directly as if it was something, some sort of uh, native uh, runtime. And then the fact you can build this kind of stuff with it is so cool. Uh, TypeScript allows us to scale and refactor large code bases with confidence. So imagine that that demo I showed you was the tip of the iceberg. If we were to scale this out in a much larger way and add all the other features, having this uh, compile time static type information would be a huge benefit rather than try and debug things in the browser. And I can corroborate that with some of my commercial experience on larger projects as well. Uh, composition is generally better than inheritance for code reuse, although, to reiterate, I do think inheritance gets a hard time, and for describing system uh, taxonomy at a macro level, I think it can do the job. Uh, Entity component system is a great fit for game loops or other kind of looping architectures, I guess. But then, performance in larger games is generally tricky. OK, thank you very much for listening. Uh, the repo's there, so you can clone it and run it for yourself and give me any kind of feedback you want. But yeah, thanks for listening, and now I'm open for the questions. All right. All right. Thank you, James, for an awesome talk. We can move to questions. We have a couple of those. Uh, first one, uh, have you? Have you had the issues with audio context and browser limits regarding audio autoplay before user interaction? Uh, is, well, it, I guess that's two things. So I if that's regarding the new permissions model that was introduced where the user has to interact with uh, the page before the audio context can play, uh, because you're working with games and you have that inherent like keyboard interaction, it's usually okay. But then, yeah, I haven't had too major a problem with it. I was working on one smaller game for a contest where it was an issue, and I had to put a disclaimer in the game saying, there is sound, but it won't play until you interact. But in terms of an intelligent way of working with that policy, because I agree it's a good idea, auto playing audio on the web is a completely bad idea unless it's for these contexts. Uh, I don't have any particularly intelligent strategies that come to mind, but at least alerting the user that once you interact, sound will play. I think that's at least a starting point. Okay, thank you. Uh, second question is, what are the pros and cons in using custom solution versus something like Fraser or Phaser, sorry, for game development? It's a great question. I think a lot of my interest in entity component systems came from uh, Game Jam. So there was one I've entered a couple of times called JS13K Games. As the name suggests, you develop a game in JavaScript, 
it can't exceed 13 kilobyte, uh, kilobytes in bundle size. So you kind of having to rule out frameworks at that point. So that's where this comes handy, but I appreciate that's not an everyday situation. I think if you're writing a game commercially, you probably would want to use a framework like Phaser because it's maintained by many people, the open source community around it is excellent, and the documentation is great. I think if you want more granular control of what you're writing, rolling your own approach might be better, but for most things, I'd always suggest using an existing solution as long as it's flexible enough. Okay, thank you. We have uh, just a little bit more time, and let's go with this. Um, how does one start with learning browser game development? Um, so, I'd say in my journey, I didn't encounter that many resources targeting the web specifically. In my case, I started messing around with the Canvas API and just outputting graphics to it and building demos. So if you're familiar with like the demo scene on like the home computers in like the 80s and 90s, I think a lot of people are trying to revive that scene for the web, which is great, great if you look at Twitter, for example, which is where you're building uh, little experiments, I think, in 140 characters. So it's analogous to Twitter, or it was before they increased the character limit. Um, so I started off with the Canvas API, just mucking around, and then I looked into building games, but all my code was super, uh, it was super imperative, everything was just in line, there was no real architecture. So then I looked up architectural patterns for games, and the most common one seems to be Entity Component System. I mean, I should add, even Unity now has its own implementation, or it's getting one of this pattern, so we're going to see more of it, but for me, it was taking these pieces and putting them together. Didn't see any particularly good tutorials online, but things might be getting better. Okay, we have still more time. Um, let's say, go with this one. Have you uh, used Flow? If yes, how would you compare it to TypeScript? That's an excellent question. So I have used Flow. It was admittedly uh, just under two years ago, so Things might have changed now, but at the time I used it, I actually found the inference in a lot of cases to be better than TypeScript. So what's really cool is you can declare functions and you don't annotate the parameters, and the compiler can infer what types those will be based upon the usage of that function within your code base. And if you mix the types, you'll get a warning saying, in some places you're passing a string as this parameter, whereas in others you're passing a number. Now, I actually prefer an explicit failure because the types mismatch. I think that's more robust. But in a lot of places, Flow's inference was better. The only thing I'd say is I didn't think the language server was that good. So it was quite slow. Uh, you'd have to restart often. Again, things might be better now. Like I appreciate it's an open source project, but I didn't have a good time with the tooling. I think TypeScript is significantly better, and how you can manage and install the types as well uh, from NPM. It's super flexible. Okay, thank you. That's all. Uh, rest of the questions, feel free to approach James yeah. afterwards and get your answers. Thank you, James, for an awesome talk. Thank you.